Shabbat Shalom. This week's Devar Torah is generously sponsored by Elise and Barry Richmond in honor of their 40th wedding anniversary. Mazal Tov. A friend of mine recently posted a wonderful country music video on her Facebook page entitled Uncle Carl by Aaron Lacombe. And after Shabbat, I encourage you to Google it. Featured in the video is a traditional Texas family sitting around their kitchen table on Christmas Eve, eating their holiday dinner. The scene's imagery evokes what many of us from New York might believe a holiday dinner in a small Texas town looks like. For example, the dad of the family sits at the head of the table wearing pale jeans, a white t-shirt, and a red trucker hat. All of a sudden, Uncle Carl stands up and shares some unexpected news with them, at which point the song's chorus begins to play. It goes like this. Uncle Carl came out on Christmas in front of God and all. All us kids had known for decades, but Dad had no clue at all. Carl's best friend, who had come to Christmas the last four years in a row, said, I think it's time to let you good folks know. The video then flashes to the two of them sweetly holding hands, followed by the dad's reaction, which was a mixture of shock and anger. Without saying a word, the dad gets up and walks into his family room where he predictably watches the Cowboys playing on TV. By now it's clear that this was not the reaction that Carl had hoped for, but it wasn't too unexpected either. Carl feels dismayed and as he leaves, he gently places a football on his brother's lap, perhaps as a subtle nod to him that he is the same person he has always been, and he doesn't want his brother's opinion of him to change. The song then finishes with a heartwarming ending. As Carl and Jack walk to their car, the dad chases after them and tightly wraps his arms around his brother. Finally, the embrace Carl always wanted. They talk for a while and then make their way back inside to enjoy the rest of their holiday together with smiles on their faces. It is nearly a picture perfect ending to a difficult story of coming out. However, as some of us may know all too well, this is not how these stories always end. Too often that final hug never comes or it comes far too late and with a lot of heartbreak in between. And I can't help but wonder about the anguish Carl must have felt on that journey from his car to the front door and then back again. The fear he must have felt, worrying about how this news would be received. Would he be rejected, as was almost the case? Or would he be embraced by his family, finally permitted to live out his true identity with pride? And furthermore, this video elicits the question, at least it ought to, what do we need to do in order to create the right environment to help people feel like they no longer need to hide? A question that we ought to ask ourselves as we near the end of the book of Bereshit. Hiding one's true identity is a recurring theme that has emerged from the Torah over the past several months. First, Avraham and Sarah, and then later Yitzchak, Yitzchak and Rivka pretend to be brother and sister. They devise a scheme to protect themselves from the potential cruelty of foreign leaders. Next, Yaakov, at his mother's behest, dresses up like his brother Esav because he wants to feel loved by his father and gain a blessing from him. Then Levan disguises his daughter Leah as her sister Rachel, marrying her off to Yaakov in order to spare her from embarrassment and to preserve her rights as the elder sibling. Next, Judah's daughter-in-law Tamar conceals her identity and seduces her father-in-law, as Rabbi Fisher taught us last week, in an attempt to gain some agency over her own fate. And in Parshat Miketz, Yosef hides his identity from his brothers after nearly 20 years of estrangement because he worries about what their reconciliation might mean for his own life and for theirs. 
And while these examples in the Torah are different from the coming out stories of so many LGBTQ folks, they are indicative of a similar systemic problem. In some of these examples, hiding is used as a tool to manipulate a certain outcome. Dissatisfied with the ways in which their lives unfold, these people hide in order to gain power or to get their way. But in nearly every instance, the main motivation to hide stems not from a posture of cynicism or malevolence, but from a place of fear. A fear of the status quo. A fear that without hiding, they will in some ways be left behind. And ultimately, a fear for their very safety. The Ramban's reading of Yosef and his brother's reunification makes this explicit. The Torah says, Vayar Yosef et Echav, Vayakirem, Vayit Nakker Alehem, Vayidaberi Tam Kashot. When Yosef saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he acted like a stranger toward them and spoke harshly to them. Rashi translates the word Vayit Nakker as if the root comes from Nun Kuf Resh, Nochri meaning stranger. In this way, Yosef acts strangely toward them by speaking harshly. But the Ramban, the Ramban teaches us that Yosef doesn't simply behave as a stranger, but actively hides his identity from them. When Yosef saw them, he says, he immediately recognized them and he feared, ufachad, that they would recognize him as well. So he placed his mitznefet, his royal turban on his head, and he covered part of his face so that they would not know that it was him. According to the Ramban, Yosef is not metaphorically hiding here. He is so worried about his brothers seeing him that he literally covers his face. He masks himself and renders himself unrecognizable to them. And if we are surprised by this reaction, we should ask, what reason? would Yosef have to behave any differently? Many of our classic commentators, and even the Torah itself, try to portray Yosef as a charlatan, a trickster, who delights in the torture of his brothers out of a righteous sense of anger. And while his later actions seem to support that theory, his hiding here is not that. I can only imagine what Yosef felt that first time he saw his brothers. The cruelty of being thrown into a pit, ignored as he sat there alone and frightened, crying out to them, and then sold off into slavery where he would eventually become a prisoner. Why wouldn't he hide? His brothers don't create the conditions for Yosef to feel as though he can be real with them. He hides because the sight of his brothers makes him feel unsafe. This is a feeling that I imagine many people in the LGBTQ community must feel all too often. The feeling that that music video was trying to articulate. Just this week, many lesbian couples around the country waited with bated breath while the Supreme Court decided whether or not to hear Box versus Henderson, a case out of Indiana that would deny the right of a non-biological mother to list her name on her own child's birth certificate as one of the parents. It's for this reason that many lesbian couples go through the humiliating and costly process of adopting their own children, despite the fact that they are a married couple. To make matters worse, it's not like this was some universal challenge to any non-biological parent as a general principle. According to the official court reviews, based on its analysis of Indiana statutes and case law, the Court of Appeals found that Indiana law affords a birth mother's husband the right to be listed on the birth certificate of a child born during the marriage, including when a child is born through donor insemination and it is known that the husband is not the the child's biological parent. Meaning, Box versus Henderson was shamefully a direct assault on the rights of married lesbian parents. Fortunately, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, which was a relief to many, so many families. 
but a deeper problem still exists. The very idea that a state would challenge married couples' rights to claim ownership over their own children simply because of the nature of their relationship is a failure that needs to be corrected. Of course, we can't control what other people believe or how they behave. But this is just one reminder of many of how far we still have to go to create the necessary conditions of safety for LGBTQ people. Synagogues, like all institutions, share in this responsibility. It is up to us to acknowledge our shortcomings, examine them, and take steps to correct how we operate so that those who feel marginalized can live in the world alongside us with an equal sense of belonging. How nice it would be to have a holiday dinner one day where sharing one's sexual orientation was simply a statement of fact, not some big reveal shrouded in the fear of how that news may be received. For now, that might just be a dream. But as we learn from Yosef, some dreams, especially when they are just, do come true. Shabbat Shalom.